Hi, everyone. We are back for another episode of Life Possible with a Disability, and this is a long-awaited guest of mine. This is Leah Holderbaum. She is an employee of New Motion. She's a, well. She's an occupational therapist. She works for our New Motion's medical supply division. She um, teaches at a university, and she is the cath queen, she's the catheter queen, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. So. Um, welcome, Leah. Tell us a little bit more about your journey that led you to becoming the catheter queen. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much. So I am an occupational therapist, and um, I moved to Texas about 10 years ago to join the spinal cord injury team at Baylor. And I didn't really know much about spinal cord injury, but I fell in love with the population. I fell in love with how different every day was, the challenges. Um, and just the bond that I got to create with all of my patients. And I quickly learned about a year in that OTs had a significant role with bladder management. It wasn't just a matter of inserting the catheter to drain the bladder and then removing it. It was all about fine motor coordination, dexterity, product selection, clothing management, leg management, mm -hmm. positioning strategies. There are so many dynamic pieces to cathing. And I did a bunch of research and I've been involved in a lot of really great projects. I've had a lot of fantastic opportunities and it is my life's work to spread love for bladder management so that everyone can be as educated and independent as possible in regards to their bladder management strategies. Yes. And as you, as you're saying that, I remember that you wrote a chapter in a book all about that, I right? Did. I did. Um, it a couple years ago, I spoke at a conference and then they asked me to um, author a chapter in a text. So that was released about a year ago. Yeah. So, so, so exciting. All right. So um, I love that you are so open about talking about this. Um, part of the stigma associated with it is, you know, everyone can see our wheelchairs, um, but so many of us with um, that use wheelchairs have neurogenic bowel and neurogenic bladder and nobody likes to talk about pee and poop. It's extremely private. We've learned as children, we're socialized not to talk about it, even though everyone um, does both. So um, it's a, and it, I will say as a catheter user for 34 years, I hid it from most of my friends. I was, you know, embarrassed. I didn't talk about it. And I also didn't have any peer support or anything like that because um, I was pretty isolated in South Louisiana um, with no, you know, real big internet, you know, at the time, because I'm old. Um, so I love your openness in talking about it. Um, I would love for you to share um, what you do with like New Motion customers and, the, and our sales team in kind of educating about the different products and pros and cons of them. Um, yeah, so start sure. wherever you'd like. Absolutely. So my official title, I am a medical supply account manager. So I have the opportunity to work with rehab hospitals, urology offices, and ultimately um, patients, customers, and users in regards to bladder management. And my goal is, again, to promote independence and quality of life. So I am working with folks, um, providing them with samples of products so that they um, are able to choose something that they can maintain their bladder function with and stay healthy. So looking at their hand function, looking at their functional performance skills, how independent they are with their self-care tasks. Um, do they need any sort of assistance? Is there a caregiver that may be potentially providing assistance? And what I'm doing is um, having their insurance verified and making sure that I am providing products that are going to be, um, you know, allowing them to make a financially responsible decision, but ultimately that they are going to be able to be healthy and be able to use and be compliant with. Because as we know, if someone doesn't like their bladder management strategy, they are not going to be compliant and that can result in um, you know, UTIs and other long-term effects. So I really want to um, take away a lot of that scary stigma and a lot of that um, kind of taboo thought and just um, help folks become more confident so that they can ask questions and be an advocate for themselves. And that's something that I've learned really big on this side of things, as opposed to being an OT, is that um, when folks leave the rehab hospital, many times they don't know who their provider is they don't know that they have options in regards to different types of catheters, whether it's, um, you know, just different 
brands, different, you know, makes and models for lack of better terms, mm-hmm. or even just different types of products, you know, gel and hydrophilic, they're, you know, different sizes, different lengths. So mm-hmm. um, I compare catheters to Starbucks because there's so many options and people just don't know. And so that's what I want to do. Yeah. yeah, there really are. Like sometimes we let, left rehab, we get one catheter suggested, you know, that's in the closet at the rehab and then that's it. Like we don't, it doesn't go any further. And I would say, you know, 34 years ago, there weren't, was not as much of a selection. It was kind of like a red rubber catheter and, you know, a water-based lubricant. Um, and now there, I know, and now there's tons of, of options. So why don't we maybe explain a little bit about, um, like, a regular catheter, maybe a hydrophilic, and then maybe we touch a little bit on, because we have probably have people who um, are intermittent catheter users or some people who without hand function and maybe a caregiver every day might have to use um, a Foley. So yeah. maybe. So, and that's the thing is, um, you know, there are so many different products that are available. And just because something is right for one person doesn't mean that it's going to be right for, you know, someone else else with the exact same, you know, type of bladder, you know, function. So um, there is the Foley, which is the indwelling. So that's going to be something that stays within the body, usually for about 30 days, and then it'll be changed at that point. And it just allows for a constant drainage from the bladder into a bag, and then the bag is emptied periodically on an as-needed basis. Um, The other option is when you get to intermittent catheters, there are three main um, types that fall into different thick pick codes. And they are straight catheters, um, coude catheters, which allows the catheter to advance past the prostate or any sort of scar tissue or stricture. And then you have your kits. Those are going to be the catheters that have um, bags attached. And they also come with, you know, maybe some gloves or some wipes and some swabs to really help promote, um, you know, that management of infection risk. And amidst all of those different codes, there are different products that are different types of rigidity because they're made of different materials. And the reason that's important is because someone may have varying levels of hand function and something that's more rigid might be easier for them to um, insert in advance as opposed to something that's a little more floppy. Um, Mm -hmm. So you have different, you know, types of materials and then there's different types of lubricants. You have your gel based Um, think any sort of just like a lubricating jelly. And then you also have your hydrophilic, which are um, a little more water-based. So it's kind of like a saline. And then you have some that um, there's a little sachet inside, like a little pouch. And you want to pop that. I usually tell folks, pop it like a bag of chips. Um, You know, they'll pop it, you know, even before they open it. And then it um, releases that solution to activate the coating on the catheter. And then the individual will pull it out and cath. Mm-hmm. So again, a ton of different options. And right. um, again, just because something works for one person, you know, doesn't mean yeah. that it's going to work, you know, for someone else. Yeah. In my particular situation, we've talked about this, like, you know, they taught me and everyone learns when we have really the a sterile technique, but eventually, you know, you, it, carrying gigantic kits around and beta dine and da, 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 like people get down to like where they're doing what we consider a clean calf where, you know, you're washing your hands thoroughly. Um, and then I'm very careful when I'm, when I open the catheter bag to not touch the part that will be inserted into my urethra. Um, I lubricate, I, I use, um, a type, a little kit that comes with a KY jelly. And I prefer that I have no dexterity problems, but I prefer when the hydrophilics, they have grippers on them, right? Because the coating really covers the, almost the whole catheter. And, um, I find it hard to, you know, as a female, we're dealing with a little more difficult anatomy, right, than a male. So accuracy, I like rigidity for that purpose because I don't want to waste a catheter having it Mm -hmm. contaminated by going in the wrong place. Um, So for females, we, you know, have straw walls. Um, I also don't prefer to transfer onto a toilet for a multitude of reasons, like risk of falling and, Mm -hmm. uh, sanitary reasons like you know if you're cathing in in public which I often am um right. you know I don't I don't want to transfer to the toilet I might not even be able to transfer the toilet and then I'd be stuck getting off anyway so I use an extra long rigid with uh mm-hmm. with but um and that's and uh, very so I, I can position myself and pull up my tilt my pelvis 
in a way where I have like a good view of the urethra. I still use a mirror because again, for the same reason, I don't want to touch all around trying to reduce my risk of infection. But um, it's also, I think what you get used to and um, get really good at. It's kind of like a wheelchair in the way that like, you know, once you've been using one, it's really, it's kind of hard to switch. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of and, muscle and memory. too. Yeah, hmm. like I always tell folks, I'm like, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Yeah. Um, you know, if someone's used a certain product for a certain amount of time and it's working, you know, there's no need to change it. Yeah. Um, one thing, too, that I thought that you brought up that's really interesting is just, um, you know, some people may prefer to transfer and some people may not. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, ladies, even though anatomically there is, you know, more barriers, it is more of a challenge. There are more options as well. Um, you know, a young lady can ultimately, if she chose, she could use a male length catheter and that could actually drain into the commode. So, you know, that's an option for her as well. Yeah. Um, and so also looking at, you know, just the lifestyle of the individual, um, you know, are they working? Do they go to school? Do they have to take their kids, you know, to and from, you know, dance class and, um, you know, basketball and music and all of these things. And how many times are they breaking down their chair? Um, some, you know, ladies, for example, they may want something, you know, small that can fit into their purse for date night. Yeah. Um, yeah. They may want something, you know, longer at home and they may mm -hmm. want something shorter when they're at work because they have to transfer to the commode. So mm -hmm. that's something else. Um, that I really promote is looking at all of the different components of that individual's lifestyle so that we can potentially yeah. provide a product mix because it's not a one size yeah. fits all situation. And we and they, so. you can do that to split your, most of the time, I believe yeah. you can split your order up into like, um, you know, there's, um, there are some that are like meant for, they have the pouch attached. So longer travel, like if there aren't accessible bathrooms and you're in the car or you're on an airplane, I've done it on an airplane in a closed system with a blanket over my head and my daughter sitting next to me so that I could like empty my bladder because I can't get up on the plane and go to the bathroom. And then, you know, it's all contained. Carol and Caroline, whoever's with me can just go throw it in the trash. Um, you can, yeah. you know, don't need that for home, but you might need that in the community. I think another beautiful thing about new, about new motion and the, is because we, we have some working knowledge of the type of equipment they're using and their mm -hmm. bladder and bowel routine. Um, because I, I will say when you cast from your chair, even if you're using a male, if you have a rigid front or your chair changes in some way, the distance between the toilet's gonna change and then you may have to change your supply, right? So we kind of, you know, have the best of both worlds that where we can be like, you know, is this going to, is this piece of equipment going to impede your function for your bladder routine? Mm -hmm. It's a very important question to have. Like, it's a very, very important discussion. Um, and that's what I usually speak to is the chair. You know, if someone is in a chair, the chair that they're in could 100% help or hinder their ability to be independent. Everything from the cushion to movable parts to, um, you know, dump, squeeze. Are they in manual versus power? Everything mm -hmm. can impact their independence. Yeah. Um, I think speaking a little bit about, um, like, if they, there are products out there that so for um, especially males with limited hand dexterity, um, like there's some some options and tools, right, that people can use to, um, especially men to cat themselves, right? Can you speak a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, adaptive equipment is my favorite. Um, so there is a lot of adaptive equipment that is available for both males and females. And what I usually speak to is for men, um, you know, primarily imagine they are going to have to manage their supplies, you know, hold their clothes out of the way, hold their penis in the appropriate position, hold their catheter, you know, wash their hands, all of these different things. They don't have enough hands. I will say also so, my mouth is involved. I was going to say, I use my yes. mouth. But when you're talking about that, you, like we, I have to hold things as I'm un opening packages and doing all the stuff. And I only have, and I have two good hands because I'm a T10 paraplegic, right? I still have to have my mouth. Anyway, keep going. I call that your third hand. I do. I tell all my friends, I'm like, Hey, listen, you're going to have to use your third hand. Like let's, let's make it happen. And again, you figure out your strategy and that's how I've learned most of my strategies and techniques to help other people is from friends of mine. Like they've tried this strategy and this is what works. So, 
Um, but yeah, so with men, um, you know, looking at anything we can do to make it a little bit easier. So there are um, pants holders and the name brand version is called the um, Betty Hook. And it just attaches onto the pants and it goes between the cushion of the chair and the seat. And it allows the pants to be held out of the way. Um, otherwise, I'll give men bungee cords and it serves the exact same purchase. They could per, um, purpose. They can just tie one end around the frame of their chair mm -hmm. and then the other end can come up hook into the waistband and the resistance will kind of pull it down. Um, there are penis stabilizers available. There are cuffs that are available for anyone who does have dexterity issues. It can, you know, kind of clamp onto the hand as a cuff. And then um, the catheter can be, you know, guided into this little um, clamp and then they can be, you know, independently managing that catheter, you know, advancing it through the urethra. Mm -hmm. For young ladies, um, there is also some adaptive equipment as well. Um, one such piece is called the Astacath, and it was designed by a nurse named Linda Asta. And she um, designed this product, and there's a little um, component that once it's inserted into the vagina, it has three different holes that will line up with that young lady's urethra. Wow. So if she yeah. is having any sort of you know, anatomical issues, it really serves as a guide for where that urethra is. So that can be really difficult. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, especially when you're learning, I mean, people get, you know, what, mm -hmm. what other people need to remember is like, we don't have a lot of sensation most of the time. So it's not like, you know, there's, you, you know, if you're not looking and you can't feel it, like it, that can be a tough scenario. It's amazing to me though, how people sometimes do use their hands, you know, wash their hands really well and scrub and then, and, can feel outside and then that's how they um find the urethra i mean it's a multitude of yeah. different things um so as far as like if someone's interested and in, um well i get the one more thing i did what oh, sorry. Of course not. um one thing i wanted to touch on was um you know we are catheter users are at higher risk for bladder cancer um just be because of the irritation and because of the um, frequent UTIs. And then, you know, there's some, I think that part of the education piece I'd like to touch on is just, you look at the box of the catheters that you're using and make an informed choice and just make sure about the chemicals that you're using, because there are some risk factors that you can control if you're really educated on the topic. Um, so yeah, I am, um, I know that I personally have been impacted by, by bladder cancer. Um, and the, in the tumor was exactly where the catheter bumps my bladder wall. So I don't know if you want to speak to the irritation and then the products maybe that we can help that can reduce that, that irritation. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so just like you were saying, there are certain chemicals that are, um, that have been found in some catheters that have been shown to, um, have a higher risk of carcinogens. So that is something to be aware of. And they typically do put a label on packaging. Um, so just be aware of, you know, what's going into your body. And also, you know, just in regards to UTIs, you mentioned that as well. Um, there is, you know, some people respond differently to different types of lubricant. Um, so mm -hmm. that could be the potential cause for UTIs as well. Some people respond differently to um, the different chemical compounds in the lubricant and the catheter. There's something called osmolality, which is um, that individual's pH and how it responds to the lubricant on that catheter. So that wow. can also be, you know, another factor yeah. to, you know, consider um, if you're noticing the catheter is sticking and causing any additional trauma. That's, you know, something else that should not happen. Um and also, too, just long-term catheter users. I have one of my um, really good friends. He was just seeing a urologist, and he had to get Botox um, in his bladder because his bladder had become so – the the term is trabeculated, where it basically becomes more dense, and there's all kinds of little folds and everything within the bladder. Mm -hmm. And um, bacteria can collect – you know, within those different folds and creases. And no matter how clean your technique is, no matter how wonderful you're doing with your bladder management strategy, that yeah. bacteria is still in there. So he was just having UTIs all the time. So um, it's important to really, number one, know your body, um, mm -hmm. you know, be in tune to your body, know what's going on, know what you're putting in your body. And, um, you know, understand that if you're having any sort of adverse reactions or symptoms or, um, any sort of discomfort, increased 
spasms, anything right. other than normal. Yeah, that's, and that's, yeah, we're like in a, in a disadvantage because burning and frequency and our, and, and blood in your urine, but the burning and frequency, we, we don't, you know, we might have increased spasm. We might, you know, you might not, but you know, yeah, maybe. And then blood in your urine can be indicative of, of an infection, but it can also be indicative of, of a bladder cancer. And so it shouldn't be assumed that it's normal, right? I think you ask, you advocate for yourself and you push your doctor to, to go further because typically the only way to find bladder cancer is going in with a cystoscopy. Um, you can't, urine lights up the bladder, so you can't just scan your bladder and be like, oh, you've got cancer. There might be some densities that might want them to further, you know, go look further. But, um, but my bladder cancer was found because they were going in to find a kidney, to cut up a kidney stone and just happened to be in there looking around. And um, so, you know, I was really lucky in catching it early. But Botox also is great for reducing bladder spasms if you're having a lot, but it also reduces your body's ability to warn you about things that are wrong. Because now you've exactly. Botoxed your bladder. So if it was going to be spasming at you and basically being like, hey, something's not right in here, you just paralyzed it further and you're masking the symptoms of what could be a really an early detection just like every kind of bladder cancer I think is key um so mm -hmm. I think it's an important subject and if a customer wants to uh, connect will a supplier give like say you're having an issue or maybe you just want to see what's out there because there's new things happening um oh, can you get some samples from your supplier Yes, to try people should absolutely be able to get samples. Um, and, um, you know, just some terminology is, you know, considering what type of lubricant, do you want something that's a little more rigid or less rigid, um, and really having that discussion with your supplier. There should be a representative or like an inside sales team member associated with, um, you know, the supplier in different territories. So nationwide, there should be someone who will be able to work with you and be an advocate for you. Perfect. And then definitely be able to and trial those. Yeah. I mean, I think that's a really good thing to try to do. Like you don't know what's out there unless you, you know, you can kind of get used to the one thing and, right. and that's fine. Like you said, if it's not broken, don't fix it. But as, as your body changes and your bladder changes with age and, and aging with a disability, we may have to adapt and we may have to change a product. And you, um, can I share some information? I guess I know you've written a lot of articles, educational articles. And so when I do the show notes, I'd love to put some links to some of the information that you've written and things that are like out absolutely. there. Yeah. Yeah, okay. absolutely. No, that would be great. And also I just, I want to be a resource for anybody. Um, so I'm happy to give you my cell phone number. So if anyone would like to reach out, if they have questions, comments, concerns, issues, anything bladder related. Um, great. I want I'll add your number. Yeah, your email and your phone number I'll add to the show notes as well. And then that's very generous and kind of you. But yeah, Lee is Lee's the like she is the resident expert. I've been capping for 34 years and I learn things from Leah all the time. So um so glad to call her my friend and my coworker. Um I hope that you'll come again and thank you so much for absolutely. All right. Thanks, Leah. Have a great day. Thank you so much, Karen. You too. All right, we're